up, guys? How are we doing today? Everybody good? So good to see you guys. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope City. And if you are a guest with us today, so glad that you're with us. Um, as you may, if you've been here before, you know that um, this is not my normal voice. I am not feeling well. And so um, I'm going to be out in the lobby after the service. I'd love to meet you, but not shake your hand or hug you. And so uh, I, Trisha said, do you want me to bring that chair up here? I'm like, I don't think I'm going to pass out or anything. Uh, but we'll get through the message. And uh, glad to be with you guys. We were off last week. And uh, we're out in San Diego, and uh, it was a lot warmer and more beautiful there than it is here. Uh, but it's great to be back. Miss you guys, and uh, what an incredible job uh, Greg Lee did last Sunday. And if you weren't here, I'd love to have you go back and watch uh, the video on that. I just want to say, first of all, uh, thank you guys so much for all the expression of um, breakthrough that you uh, left for Trish and I, all the cards that you guys filled out last week. Uh, they just... Uh, brought tears to my eyes and joy to my heart. And so thank you guys so much just for being a part of what God's doing here at uh, Hope City. And uh, we're three and a half years in and feel like we're just getting started. And so um, <clears throat> anyway, before we dive in, um, students, uh, right after this service, if you're a student in middle school or high school, there's donuts back in the back for you uh, to celebrate our student ministry that's taking place tonight. You can hang out back there. And then I want to uh, mention something that took place. It's a big week here at Hope City uh, this week. Um, my wife, also one of our pastors, got officially ordained this week. And uh, I think we have a few pictures. Um, do we have a few pictures? No, we don't have a few pictures of that. Um, use your imagination. We'll have, we'll have those for next service. Um, but... Uh, we uh, had our last advisory board meeting on uh, Wednesday with our pastors that oversee uh, Hope City, and they're actually officially handing off uh, leadership into an internal board here at Hope City. And, uh, and so they were able, uh, Aaron Brockett, Greg Lee, uh, Josh Huseman, and uh, Mark Malin are the four uh, pastors that were here, and they uh, laid hands on Trish and officially ordained her, and so I just want to celebrate her uh, today on that milestone in her ministry. So. <clears throat> Well, um, we are kicking off a brand new series today. If you can't tell what it is, just look behind me. And uh, it's called Exo Relationship Goals. And, and many of you guys know, my wife and I wrote a marriage book a few years ago. We travel and speak. We were in Portland yesterday. Not Oregon, Portland, Indiana. If you don't know where that is, you, and you're not alone, all right? We didn't know where it was either. It was Northeast Indiana. We were there yesterday. We were in San Diego last week. We're in Houston next week. Uh, we're in Memphis the following week. Uh, and so we, uh, February's a big month for us. We travel and do marriage conferences. We did a marriage conference here at Hope City back in November. And so relationship series and relationship talks, relationship messages are really close to our heart. Uh, they're a passion of ours. We believe that in order to have anything healthy in your life, you have to have healthy relationships. The quality of your life is gonna be largely determined by the quality of your relationships. If you have a bunch of toxic relationships in your life, my guess is you're not going to be joyful. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to be fulfilled and you're not going to thrive if you don't have healthy relationships. And so this, the next few weeks, we're not talking, this isn't a marriage series, even though uh, we do talk a lot about marriage, uh, we'll spend part of one week on marriage. Uh, but this is just a relationship. If you have any relationships in your life, this series is for you. And, um, and so we're gonna, next week, we're going to talk about uh, what it, be, it means to be single. Uh, the next week, the following week, we're going to talk about sex and marriage. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, all kinds of friendship aspects. And so it's just going to be a huge series for us to really dial in on getting healthy in our relationships. And um, before we dive in, though, I want to uh, call your attention to these cards that are on your chair. If you could take those out. We're going to get to know one another here, a little audience participation. I'm going to make some statements, and I want you, those of you that are not patient, you're going to raise this card up before I tell you to raise it up, all right? So don't do that. I want you to listen to both statements. There, thank you, Tim. Uh, you're going to listen to both statements, uh, and then I want you to make a decision. Now, this night might not, like, completely describe your life, but hopefully, generally, it will describe uh, your personality or how you're wired, okay? So here's the deal. Hold up an X, which is the pink card. Hold up an X if this describes you. I don't mind... I'm going to read both of them, so don't hold it up. Don't hold it up immediately, okay? Some of you are getting ready to, okay? And I haven't read it yet. All right. <clears throat> I don't mind conflict in a relationship, and I'm usually able to speak my mind freely. Okay? So that's, that's the first one. That's an X. Hold up an O if this describes you. I run from conflict like the plague and take every criticism personally. Okay? be me right here, okay? Lots of conflict avoiders in this audience, all right? And uh, my wife is holding up an X, and that's funny. All right, there we go. All right. Hold up an X if this describes you. When I'm upset, 
I usually talk with the person I'm upset with either in person or voice to voice over the phone. Okay, so that's, that's one person. Hold up an O oh, if this is you. When I'm upset, I share all of my feelings via text message or Facebook inbox. Who are my angry texters, all right? So X if you talk, O if you text. Wow, I'm really impressed right now, all right? That's, that's pretty impressive right there. I don't even, I'm not gonna tell you what I am, all right, there we go. Um, hold up an X if this is you. After the first date, that is the appropriate time to follow a person on Instagram or send them a Facebook request, okay, after the first date. That's an X. Hold up an O if this is you. I followed this person long before our first date. Who are my Facebook stalkers, all right? So X if it's after the first date, O if it's you've already followed them way before you even go out with them, ask them out. Okay, wow, okay, a lot of stalkers out there. All right, <clears throat> last one. Hold up an X if this is you. When my alarm goes off, I hit snooze over and over and over again. Oh, when my alarm goes off, I jump out of bed joyfully. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a snoozer. All right, this drives Trisha crazy. She's like, why are you torturing yourself? I'm like, I'm not torturing myself. I'm getting five minutes and 30 seconds extra of sleep. That's what I'm doing. All right, well, every aspect of our life involves relationships. Every single aspect. There's not one part of your life that does not involve relationships with people. Last week, I mentioned we flew to San Diego. We went out a day early and we stayed a day later just to kind of get away. Because of the move, we didn't take any time off between Christmas and New Year's, and, uh, which is typically when I get sick. I usually get sick between Christmas and New Year's, and so I've, I've delayed it by about eight weeks, which is awesome. Um, but we flew out to San Diego, and as we were flying out, I said to Trish, I said, hey, you know, we're only two hours from L.A. We could drive up and see the Kobe Bryant um, memorial. And so we land, we get some lunch, and... And uh, she's like, hey, let's drive up to LA. So we drove up and it was, it was unbelievable because there were, I'm gonna say, I'm not real good at estimating numbers. I'm gonna say between two and 3,000 people were there just kind of walking around. And it was so quiet and so somber. And it was like you were at a viewing of a friend, but I would say 99% of the people there had never met Kobe Bryant. And there were thousands of flowers and hundreds of candles and hundreds of balloons. And they had these um, 10 by 12 uh, big like poster board type things that you could sign and, and write a note to Kobe Bryant or write a note to his family and write, you know, write a tribute to him. And it was just, it was amazing to me that thinking about all of the people there that had never met Kobe Bryant, but how many people there related to him. All right, th this week, if you've been uh, following this week, the Democratic uh, uh, primaries have been going on, all the debates. And I was watching uh, some follow-up conversations and some interviews the other night after one of the debates. And one of the commentators said this, the Democratic Party is still looking for the candidate who can relate best to the American people. They're still looking for that person, right? And, and so I think every aspect of our life is centered on relationships. Yesterday, Robert Montgomery Knight Walked into Assembly Hall for the first time since 2000, first time in 20 years. Dan Schulman, one of the commentators for ESPN, said this. He said, it feels to me like there's restoration taking place between Bobby Knight and IU basketball. Like, it doesn't matter if it's politics. It doesn't matter if it's sports. It doesn't matter if it's friendship. It doesn't matter if it's work. Relationships are the most common thread to every aspect of our life. You cannot do anything in this life and not relate to other people. And so as followers of Jesus, I think it is um, imperative for us that we learn how to be the most healthy people when it comes to relating to others. Like we, we, should, we should have the most healthiest relationships because we're connected to the God of the universe. We're, we're, we've been given grace and mercy and second chances. We've been given unconditional love. We know the God of the universe. And so that should pour out into every aspect of our life, especially our relationships. But I, I don't know if you would agree with this, that it's sad that I think some Christians have actually the worst relationships and they have the worst representation of the love of God and they don't represent God in their relationships. And there's actually no difference between a lot of Christians and a lot of people who don't follow God when it comes to relating to others. And so over the next few weeks, what I really want to do is I really want to not teach you how to have a great marriage, not teach you how to have five happy hops to good friendships, not teach you how to, um, you know, to, to date properly. 
what I want to do is I want to turn the mirror inward and say, okay, how can we be healthy so that we can have the healthiest relationships? Because all of us have relationship goals. We all have goals for our friendship. We all have goals for our dating life. If you're single, uh, if you, we all have goals for our marriage. Um, if you're married, but before we pursue goals, we have to be the healthiest version of us. We have to do that first. The only common denominator in all of your relationships is you. You realize that, right? The only common denominator between your work, your friendships, your home, your neighborhood, your family, the only common denominator amongst all of those people is you. It's me. And what happens so often is we bring every we bring ourselves into every relationship, every job, every friendship, every date, every marriage, every family relationship. And the only constant in all of those things is either our function or our dysfunction. And what I've seen happen so often in my life is that I have the same issues with a number of different people, right? I, I, I have the same issues with my family as I do with friends. I have the same issues with, in my marriage as I do at work. I have the same issues with people. And I think, why can't they change? If they would just change, my life would be good, right? If my brother wasn't like that, then I would be good. If my coworker wasn't like that, then I would be good, right? But I have the same issues with all of those different people because I bring me into every relationship. About, I don't know, 15 years ago, 17 years ago now, I was in my third or fourth youth ministry in like four or five years, and I would go from church to church and the youth ministry would grow and things would go well initially and then I would get into performance reviews. And I'd get into a performance review, you know, when I was 22 years old, 23 years old, right out of college and they would say some things and they're like, but you have a lot of potential. And which is really kind of a backhanded compliment, right? Like you're not living up to it is what they're saying. When they say you have a lot of potential, that means you're not living up to whatever God's placed in you. And, and so I'm like, you know what? These guys don't get me. I need to go somewhere else that pr- appreciates me. I need to go to a bigger church. So I go to a bigger church. Things go great. And then I go performance reviews. And you know what they said? The same thing that the other people said. And I go to the next church and things go great for the first six months. And then I get a performance review. And you know what they say? The same thing that the first two people say. And you know who I think is, there, who the, who I think is at fault? Those churches. They just don't get me. They just don't understand. I need to be where somebody appreciates me. And maybe you've gone through a lot of jobs thinking that the problem each time was with your boss. Maybe you've gone through a ton of dating relationships thinking that the people that you date are at fault for the problems that you have in dating. Maybe you're in a a marriage right now and it feels so distant and what you think is if my spouse would just get it together, if my husband would just change, if my wife would just be more patient, then we could have the marriage that I have in mind. And that all may be true. But if you don't become healthy, it does not matter how much the person that you're in a relationship with changes, you're still going to have the same issues. And we all have goals for our relationships, but if we're going to accomplish any relationship goals, we have to first get healthy. Becoming a healthy person is the only way to have healthy relationships. And it's impossible for us to have a healthy marriage if we're not healthy. It's impossible for us to have healthy friendships if we're not healthy. And after 24 years of marriage and 23 years of parenting and 20 years in ministry and 45 years of being a son and 43 years of being a brother and a lifetime trying to be a good friend, being relationally healthy, I found, is not something you drift into. It's something that you have to choose. You have to choose it at work. You have to choose it at home. You have to choose it in your friendships. You're not going to drift into being a relationally healthy person. A few weeks ago, I I heard a pastor in Chicago, her name's Jeannie Stevens. She was talking on relationships and she made some statements that I thought were really profound. I want to share a few with you this morning. She said, everyone wants to, to be with someone. Not everyone becomes someone that others want to be with. Everyone wants to be with somebody, whether that be a friend, a spouse, dating relationship, but not everybody wants to be the kind of person that other people want to be with. We have five kids, our um, three that live at home. Our oldest that lives at home is a sophomore in high school. He plays basketball for Zionsville and he's had a really rough season. Um, he just it hasn't played out like he thought it was going to. 
He hasn't gotten the playing time that he thought he was going to get. And his performance has been off the charts. He's shooting like 70% from the field. Uh, he's averaging like two points and two rebounds in like under five minutes. And he just has not, for whatever reason, has not been able to get on the floor. And it's been discouraging and it's been infuriating. And I've written like 500 emails and deleted them to the coach over and over and over again. And I haven't sent them, right? Because that's how I deal with conflict, right? Because of the email. No, I'm just joking. Um, and so it's just been really hard watching him walk through this. But he has chosen to be an amazing teammate in the process. He stands up and cheers for every single teammate. He high fives everybody. He stands up off the bench when people come out of the game. He's encouraging. He's the first one to, to celebrate other people's success. And a couple of weeks ago, um, he didn't play. Like he got in, scored, um, and then came right back out. And you could just tell he was just dejected, but he kept getting up off the bench and cheering. And after the game, a couple of parents came up to Trish and I, and they're like, I, you know, other than my son, I love watching Isaiah most. Like he's the best teammate. I love watching him celebrate other people. Well, then this last Thursday, um, there was an injury to one of the starters, and so Isaiah started, and he balled out. He had 14 points and nine rebounds. And I think he missed like four shots. He shot like 70% from the field and uh, second leading score on the team. And you know what was so cool? We won by one. But other than the win and celebrating the win, all of the parents and all of the players were lined up to celebrate him. It was just this cool thing, seeing the emotional investment. He had become the type of teammate that other teammates wanted. Right? Despite his circumstances, despite him not getting the playing time he thought, he chose to be the type of teammate that other teammates want to be around. And everybody wants to be in relationships, but not everybody wants to become the type of person that, one, that other people want to be around. Another statement is everyone wants a relationship that satisfies all their needs. Not everyone understands relationships are not meant to satisfy your needs. If you want to set a relationship up to fail... If you want to set yourself up to be hurt, if you want to set yourself up to experience heartache and disappointment in your relationships, look to a human relationship to give you what only God can. You will be disappointed with your wife if you place God's size expectations on her. You'll be constantly frustrated with your husband if you expect your husband to take away your anxiety, take away your fear, take away your insecurity. No human being can solve those things. You'll be let down by a dating relationship. You'll convince yourself that this person needs to heal your heart and they need to bring a sense of purpose to your life. No dating relationship can do that. You want to damage your relationship with your kids? Make your entire life revolve around your kids. Remove God from the center of your life and place your kids at the center of your life. And what you think is, I'm orienting my, I want, I want to be a good parent. I want everything to revolve around them. What they see is you worshiping them more than you worship God. See, one person cannot satisfy you. They cannot complete you. They cannot make you whole. There, there's not one instance all throughout scripture where we see a human relationship carry God-sized qualities and bring God-sized fulfillment. Only Jesus can bring that to our heart. And so every time we place God-sized expectations on a human being, we set ourselves up to be dissatisfied and frustrated in that relationship. And we set the person that we're expecting them to be God, we set them up for failure too. They feel discouraged. They feel disappointed. They feel like they're always letting you down. They feel like there's oh, just that one thing that they can never do right for you. Everyone can see the flaws in others. Not everyone is willing to admit their flaws. Everyone can see the flaws in others. Not everybody's willing to admit their flaws. I do a lot of marriage counseling, partly because of my vocation, partly because of kind of our story. And I was trying to think this week of a time where someone came into a marriage counseling environment and they sit down with their spouse and they say, hey, 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 I know that this person that I'm married to that I love very much is not perfect. But let me take the first 30 minutes just to tell you all my flaws. Let me take the first 30 minutes of our session just to tell you how jacked up I am. Let me tell you how I've messed up my marriage. Let me tell you how I disappoint my wife. Let me tell you how I make my husband mad. Nobody does that, 
right? They come in and they want me to know how jacked up their spouse is. That's the whole point, right? They're sitting there. And here's the deal. I used to meet with couples separately. Like, so somebody would send me an email. Hey, I'd like to get together. and My wife and I are not connecting. And I say, okay, let's get together for a coffee. And I meet with the husband. You know what it is? It's like a 30 minute gripe session about his wife. And you know then what I have to do? I have to go meet with the wife to get her perspective on what he just said, which is completely different right? Because all she has is problem with him. Then I have to get together with both of them and we've all just wasted three hours of our life, right? Because we say, oh, you know what? I need, I see this flaw in you, but I'm not willing to admit my own flaws. It would be refreshing if somebody came in and sat down and said, let me tell you how broken I am. Let me tell you how messed up I am. We'll get to her later, all right? That would be amazing, but we don't do that. We think they are so messed up and if they weren't so messed up, our marriage, our relationship would not be so messed up. Everyone wants to fix someone else. Not everyone is willing to allow God to fix them. There's a honeymoon period for all relationships. There's a honeymoon period with a new roommate. There's a honeymoon period with a new job, a new boss, new coworkers. There's a honeymoon period with a new relationship, a new marriage. And we think to ourselves, well, he's a little bit late sometimes, but that's kind of endearing, right? My boss is a little insecure, but he pays me a lot, so I can look over that. Wait, wait, oh, she's not exactly, she's kind of bossy, but maybe it's just more like she's willing to take charge, right? And after that honeymoon period wears off, everything that you thought was cute, everything that you thought was endearing, what becomes so annoying, right? Like, I wish they would change that. I wish they would not be that way. You thought he was cute being late. Now you hate being late, right? Like that, that's not cute at all. That's just irresponsible. And if you're not becoming a healthy person, in your life personally, you'll allow the unhealth of other people to dictate the health of your relationships. Now, now some of you are like, well, Justin, what, what about people in my life? Shouldn't they, aren't they responsible for being healthy too? Well, you would hope so, but you're not in control of that. Right? You can't control that. And, and so quickly as we close, I just want to give you three questions to, to ask this week to help you evaluate how you can begin building healthy relationships, Okay. So three questions that I think will help you as you pursue health. The first question is this, am I emotionally healthy? Am I emotionally healthy? One of the biggest mistakes I've made in my relationships and one of the biggest mistakes I see other people make is taking for granted the importance of emotional health. Your emotional health can move a relationship forward or can hold a relationship back. I've been in a season of my life that's been very unique. Uh, both Trish and I have. Uh, we have um, an adult child that got married. We have another adult child that got engaged. We adopted two kids. My dad just passed away uh, in December, two weeks before Christmas. Well, those are emotional things. Some of them very good, right? Like I, I love that my son got married. I love that my other son is getting married. Like those are things we're celebrating, but they're still emotional things. My dad passing away was an emotional thing. And it was one of those things I remember early in January, just sitting down with my journal. And I wrote down this statement. I said, I feel okay, but I know I'm not okay. Right? Like there's just this, I just know that there's an emotional health aspect to losing a parent that I have to process. I came across this passage of scripture in Jeremiah that I love. It says this, I will restore your health and heal your wounds, says the Lord, for you are called outcast, Jerusalem for no, for no one who cares, for, for whom no one cares. And it's like God is speaking to those of us that knows what it is to be wounded, to, knows what, to know what it is to be forgotten or left out or overlooked. Do you struggle with depression or anxiety or fear Do you battle insecurity? Are you in a codependent relationship? Are you worried about what others think of you? See, those are matters of emotional health. And ignoring those things does not make your relationships better, right? It just carries a sense of emotional baggage into those relationships. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on as a church is being a place where it's okay to not be okay. We don't have to fake it. And we can't heal emotionally by ignoring our emotional stuff, right? And so maybe this week, the, the first step, the only step that God wants you to take is just identifying, am I, am I emotionally healthy right now? 
Am I firing on all cylinders from an emotional standpoint? Next question is this. Am I growing spiritually? Am I growing spiritually? One of the things we say around here all the time is we're not interested in behavior modification. We want to pursue heart transformation. And historically, at least when I grew up, uh, the church was really about behavior modification. It was about going through religious motions and memorizing scriptures and, you know, bringing your Bible and inviting friends. You got stars for all this stuff. And then you, if you got enough stars, you got a pizza party. And if you got a pizza party, then, you know, you could, you know, uh, you know invite friends to this pizza party. And it was just, it was based on all the things that we could know about God, based on all the things that we could do for God. And there's nothing wrong with memorizing scripture. There's nothing wrong with coming to church. There's nothing wrong with bringing your Bible to church or inviting friends to church. But if we're looking at performance-based Christianity, then we'd never really transform our heart. We just modify our behavior. We just become different people in different environments and we never really grow spiritually because more knowledge about God doesn't necessarily equate to a relationship with God. And one of the things that I want us to evaluate as a church and individually and corporately is this idea of what does it look like to grow spiritually? What, what does that look like? How do you quantify that? And the Bible is so amazing because it gives very practical, practical and profound wisdom when it comes to evidence of transformation. Look at this passage of scripture in Galatians. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. You want to know if you're growing spiritually? This is how you know. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Like Paul's saying, like if you're growing in your relationship with God, you know what's gonna overflow out of you? Joy. You know what's gonna overflow out of you? Gentleness. You know what's gonna overflow out of you? If you're growing spiritually, you're gonna be more patient today than you were six months ago. You're gonna be more joyful today than you were a year ago. You're gonna be more self-controlled today than you were five years ago. Like, like this, this is like a litmus test for our, for our spiritual growth to say, okay, God, am I, am I more joyful today than I was five years ago? Am, am I growing in patience? It's always amazing to me to encounter people who have been in church in years and they're more angry and more bitter at age 75 than they were at age 25. When, when they've been walking with God for 50 years and they should, they should grow, they, th those people should be the most joyful, the most patient, the most kind. Like my desire as I get older is to, is to exhibit more of the fruits of the Spirit than I did when I was 25, more of the fruits of the Spirit than I did when I was 30. When I'm 80 years old, I want to lead the way in gentleness and goodness and self-control. That's, that's a, a barometer for our spiritual growth. No matter what type of relationship you're in, you growing spiritually will always be good for that relationship. And let me say this. Even if that person doesn't grow, even if that person doesn't change, even if your brother never stops one-upping you, even if your spouse never changes, even if your best friend never stops talking about you behind your back, like, like regardless of other people's commitments to their own personal change, you growing spiritually gives you the wisdom and discernment to become the person that God has in mind, irregardless of what other people in relationships do. Finally, Am I loving authentically? Am I loving authentically? And I think what happens sometimes in relationships is we start loving people for what they can do for us rather than for who they are. We love people to the extent that we need them. And as a pastor, this is a really, I want people to feel valued and I want people to feel empowered and I want people to feel set free to serve. But if I'm not careful, I can attach myself to people to the extent that they move the mission of the church forward. And once they stop doing that, I don't do this out like consciously, I just move on to another person who is moving the mission forward. And so about two years ago, um, we had a, a family that helped us start Hope City and for a number of different reasons, partly because of some of the things they were going through, uh, they transitioned to an older and, and kind of more established church about a year after we started. And it, was, it wasn't devastating because I encouraged them to do it. I felt like it was best for their family. But it was one of those things where I felt like God prompted me, me and this, the, the guy in the, in the family, the, the husband, we, we got together every week for coffee. 
And so <clears throat> we were meeting for coffee and he's like, hey, I just want you to know like this will be our last Sunday at Hope City and thanks for all that you and Trisha have done, blah, 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 and all you've walked us through. And he's like, so I guess we're not gonna meet next week. And I said, no, well, let's meet. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, why, why would we not meet? And so every Tuesday for the last two years, we get together on Tuesday morning and we meet partly because I value that relationship and partly because I want there to be a sensitivity in my heart to not use people to the extent that they just feed into my vision or what is good for me or what is good for the church. And so as you look at the people in your life, are you loving your kids for who they are or who you want them to be? Are you loving your spouse for who they are or who you wish they would be? Are you loving your friends for who they are or who they promised they would be? Right? Our, our love has to be authentic. Look, look at this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians. It says, love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does, not keep, it, not, it does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. If you want to know whether or not you're loving authentically, are you patient are you kind? Are you boastful? Are you proud? Are you rude? Right, it's a, it's a good barometer. It's a good filter for you to say, okay, in my marriage, in my dating life, in, in, at work, in my subdivision, it, with my extended family, does this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, does it describe the type of love that I am giving to other people? See, healthy relationships aren't a reflection of our intentions. They're a collection of our choices. And you're not gonna be able to drift into healthy relationships. You're gonna have to fight for it. And you may have to go to counseling for it. And you may have to go meet with a friend for it. And you may have to have a sit down conversation with your spouse for it. And you may have to have a talk with a good friend for it. You may have to go ask forgiveness for it. You may have to pay the price to have healthy relationships. But can I just tell you, a healthy you makes every relationship better. Let's pray together. God, we uh, thank you so much that you long to be in a relationship with us. That you don't base uh, your relationship with us on our performance. You don't base it on um, how good we are. It's all based on how loving you are. And so we come to you today with this desire to pursue you, to grow in our relationship with you and to allow you to transform our heart. We're not in control of the other people in our life, but we are in control of our choices. And so would you allow us to become more emotionally healthy? Would you allow us to evaluate, are we growing spiritually? And would you give us the courage to love authentically? We know that you can do in our relationships more than we ever could. And so we surrender those to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand up on your feet if you can. And we're going to respond to Pastor Justin's message and give our hearts to Jesus and say, first things first, let's get things settled with you. Let's return him to being the king of our heart.
You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. excited. Our very dear friend, uh, Annie Downs, is coming here to Hope City in March. So take a look at the screens. Hey, friends at Hope City, this is Annie F. Downs. And I'm Jonathan Pecluda. And I'm Mike.